This episode of Ange TV is brought to you by Tim Hortons, located at 3760 Boule des Source in Dollar des Armeaux and 305 Rue Brunswick in Pointe Claire, Quebec, Canada. Tim Hortons, always fresh, toujours frais. What is up, guys? We are live! <laughs> Welcome back to the Ange TV show, guys. It is nice to see you. It is episode 81, guys, and I'm really excited to bring on our guest for today because I have a million questions for this guy, guys. We are talking soccer today, guys. So get all your football friends here and let's ask some awesome questions to our guest. But before we bring him on, guys, I just want to remind you all to not to forget to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Share it out with all your friends that like soccer and other sports. And answer the question at the top of the chat, which is, have you ever played soccer, guys? I want to know how many soccer fans we have here. So please answer that question. Guys, our guest for tonight, uh, I would say in Montreal, He's definitely a pioneer in the soccer community. Uh, he played for the Montreal Impact. He played for Team Canada, guys. And he's one of the first Quebec-born players to sign a contract in Serie A. He is none other than Mr. Sandro Grande. <laughs> How's it going, Edge? How you doing, I'm doing good, yeah. Sandro. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you very much for accepting the invite, Sandro. And I want to thank Mr. Reno Var, Reno Vercchio, for the suggestion uh, to get Sandro on. I've been waiting for this day. I had it circled in my calendar, actually. So <laughs> you're one of the most interesting guests of the month, I would say, that I was anticipating. Uh, we have Raul over here. He says, Sandro, I'm with you when you kick that ball. <laughs> <laughs> we have Sugar Sean P. He's saying, what's up, bro? And Jerry P., which is my brother, uh, he has a question for you, Sandro, already. Sandro, who's your favorite soccer player? Uh, I would, uh, this day and age, I would say Messi. And then um, of all time, it's a good choice. Italian, Italian Roberto Baggio, of all time, Messi, Ronaldo, and uh, Maradona. We you know what? Why, why do you think Messi is your – why is it your favorite player? Do you think he's the best player of all time? Um, yeah, I do. I do. He's, he's done – Really? He's done things like I know a lot of people talk about, you know, Diego Armando Maradona and uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, and yeah, they're all great players. Like, there's no, no ifs, ands, or buts. Nobody can take that out of my mind. I just find that Messi does things that I've like. It's very similar to what Maradona used to, do. Okay. Uh, but the difference I find is, you know, he was a little bit more serious in his career. He was healthier. He was. Uh, and he was more consistent. You know, Maradona wasn't as consistent as sure. uh, as Messi or Ronaldo. But and and we could say that Maradona, in some ways, kind of cheated, right? Yeah, I guess. I guess if you want to call it that way, yeah. <laughs> the hand of God. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Juice Box is in the building. What's up? He says hello, Ange and Sandro, and also Barry O'Hagan is from Ireland. He says, "Hey, Ange, hey, Sandro, guys, do you remember when Northern Ireland uh, they shot the ball? I think it was a penalty shot." It hit the top of the post, and then, and then it went on the goal line. And that was before goal line technology. Do you remember that, Sandro? No, I don't remember that, no. They literally did not did not make the World Cup because of that call, and it was before goal line technology. So that's why it's actually because of them that goal line technology came to be. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah. Well, what's, what's funny is that Italy is going to play against uh, Portugal in uh, – in, uh, well, not going to play against Portugal. But Italy and Portugal didn't qualify for the, the World exactly. Cup. Exactly. It's one of the two. It's either Portugal or Italy. That's going to be yeah. interesting. And, and Portugal, when they played Serbia in Serbia, <laughs> had uh, scored, and uh, they didn't have goal line technology at the game. Exactly. The ball went over the line about a yard. I think it was Ronaldo that scored. Yeah. And a defender cleared it, and they didn't allow the goal. If, uh, if, they, if that goal would have been allowed, Portugal would have been in the World Cup right now. Wow, unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, I think we talked a bit uh, ahead of ourselves. So, Sandro, do you want to give a very brief intro introduction to the guests of who you are? Yeah, so basically born and raised in Montreal, um, like many. Uh, Italian from St. Leonard. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I went to school in the East End. At uh, 18, 19, uh, started thinking about my post uh, or my next step in my, uh, in my life with regards to soccer. 
Yeah. And um, had some opportunities to go to the U.S. Yeah. Uh, with the NCAA sco- uh, scholarships. And uh, just decided uh, I wasn't going to go to the U.S. And uh, decided to take my chances, go to Europe and uh, see what could uh, could become. So I'm just curious. You had opportunities to play in the U.S. What what made you decide not to go? <clears throat> I think for me it was more... My heart was in football. My heart was in soccer. And I said to myself, if I go to U.S. for four years, I was 18. I'll come out of there at 22. And at 22, to go to Europe is going to be a lot more difficult. So I said, yeah. you know, you, you only you only live once. I gave myself two years. Yeah. So I said, let me go at 18. Let me see how it is at 18, 19. And then if it doesn't work out, at 20 years old, I could have still gone back to, uh, to NCAA. So that was still going to be an option later okay. on. Yeah. Um, but at first, my best, you know, my best bet was going to be going to Europe. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, Sanjo, let's back up a bit. Uh, I want to know your childhood, growing up. Uh, like, you know, what, what, how was it with the parents and everything, your community, all that stuff? Look, I mean, uh, growing up, uh, you know, Italian parents. So obviously, <laughs> every now and then uh, they put you in your place. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, look, you know, growing up, uh, playing football a lot, playing soccer, like from early ages, um, you know, I just started loving the game from a very young age. Um, I was training with, uh, five and six year olds when I was only four. Wow. And, uh, what's funny is that I wasn't allowed to actually play games back then. Nowadays, there are uh, four year olds that play and stuff. Uh, but back in the day there was, uh, I was one of the only ones that was playing. And um, I remember every time they used to play a game, my parents told me that when they, when the the group of players that I was training it with was allowed to play games, I was so sad. And just because I wasn't allowed to play, I was too young. <laughs> um, so I used to go train with them. I used to be at the park all the time. You know, my brothers played, uh, my uncle uh, coached. Um, I was always in the environment and, you know, uh, waking up Sunday mornings to watch uh, Italian Serie A. Like, yeah. uh, like back in the day, that was... Uh, you know, nowadays they play on Fridays, on Mondays, on Saturdays. They play almost all the time. But back in the day, it was Saturday morning or that's it. That's all you saw, you know. So Yeah. But uh, what made you choose between, like, you know, hockey, for example? Over here, it's like uh, hockey is very popular. You know, like what, what made you decide soccer? Well, you know what? I, I actually never played hockey um, um, in a club. Uh, my brothers tried for a year or two or a couple of years. Yeah. But uh, for me, it was uh, soccer from day one. I guess my parents uh, saw the passion that I had for it. And, you know, I don't know if, you know, maybe price uh, played a factor or budget yeah. or whatever. But Exactly. Um, it's more expensive to play hockey. And a lot of people, that's why they play soccer. That's why it's the most accessible sport yeah, in the of world. Course. I mean, it's not that expensive. Back in the day, it was so it was very inexpensive to play. Like, now it's starting to get a little bit more expensive. But, yeah. um, you know, and I also think, like, what from what i hear from what my parents tell me or whatever it was like really installed from the beginning i mean it was yeah. so i had that passion for it uh, i didn't want to play anything else i i played tennis i played tennis very like very well and and often uh, but even there i never joined a club or anything just played with uh, you know my buddies my uh, my my relatives or whatever mm-hmm. um and and soccer was my thing i mean <laughs> you know from a young age nowadays the kids they're you know they're you got to play many sports and you got to do so many things at, at once. And, yeah. and then they kind of like lose focus on that one objective, one goal. And mm-hmm. I remember the message at my house was, was basically, look, you're going to play one and you're going to concentrate on it and you're going to focus on it and you're going to train for it. Beautiful. You want to play other sports, go play with your friends at the park. No problem. You know, do what you got to do, but concentrate on one and do it properly, you know? And, and I think that was, that was something that was, um, uh, kind of like uh, <laughs> custom back then, but I appreciate that because it just shows it just shows that you're you know you're you're focused you're 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 driving towards one goal you know absolutely we got some questions here uh, Luke O'Connell welcome to the live stream uh, says Sandro what's your guilty pleasure <laughs> I don't even, I don't even know what he means by that I, I won't answer that I, I don't know what he's talking about <laughs> um, thoughts on Mason Greenwood. Yeah, that's uh, look. I don't know the whole story. I know what you guys know. I know what everybody else knows, mm. uh, just from social media and stuff like that, and the news outlets. Absolutely. It's a sad incident, but you know, if if it does uh, pan out to be true, it's uh, it's pretty sad. Um, Absolutely. He, he ruined his career, but who cares about career? It's just more, yeah. 
that you know the way you are yeah. as a uh, as a human being. So, so at what point, Sandro, did you go to Italy? At what point you moved to Italy, right? Yeah. So I left at eighteen. Um, okay. I had uh, somebody named um, Tony Colingo who helped me uh, get a couple of tryouts. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Tony, for that. <laughs> Um, so I started off actually the first tryout I went on, uh, was with Pescara and that was, uh, thanks to, um, to Italo Di Giochino, uh, yeah. who had his, uh, who had some contacts there through his, uh, his cousins and, um, went there, tried out, uh, it went, um, it went well, I, I made the Primavera team, um, nice. But the only thing is I was only eligible to play that one year because Primavera is until U19. So I really only had one season to play. And the club basically told me, listen, like you can play here one year. And, and but from you to jump from the U19 to the first team, it's, it's going to be very tough. Yeah. So, so in a year from now, you're going to go and play on loan in third, fourth or fifth division. So might as well just go right away. And then... I said, no problem. So from there, uh, Tony actually and Klingo helped me out with a, uh, an agent in Italy and uh, brought me to Lumezzane in the north. Nice. And uh, at Lumezzane, I did very well in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in my trial. And um, I thought I was going to sign, and uh, it, it just didn't work out. It was, uh, you know, it was January. It was uh, December, January, and the timing wasn't right. Um, they they were doing very well in their in their league and um if i was going to go there i was going to probably sit on the bench for six months so uh same thing there you know the the, the suggestion was go play in, in serie d and see how it goes from there and then we'll we'll monitor uh, you know your progression you know yeah and uh so that's what i did i went to play in serie d and um started off just for a couple of months in my mom's town just to keep in shape i was nothing uh too too serious and then the year after, with uh, the help of Tony again, uh, went to Izernia, signed with Izernia in Serie D. Nice. And, uh, and then from there, didn't play much the first month and then just started playing. And, you know, I scored out of, in 30 games, I scored eight goals as a center midfielder, wow. uh, which is pretty good. Absolutely. And, um, and that's where I met my coach, uh, who uh, to this day is uh, still a mentor, uh, Stefano Sandera. Um, and then I just, uh, from there, the year after, followed the Sandera to, a, uh, to another team, Potenza. Yeah. Uh, did very well again. And then the year after, uh, he went to Frosinone. And mm -hmm. I followed him to Frosinone. And uh, that's where I basically exploded the, my third year in Italy. I, I was uh, in Frosinone. I was basically one of the top uh, Serie D players in, in Italy wow. um, as a midfielder. And... Um, I was ranked top ten midfielders in in the in the in the Serie D in Italy, mm -hmm. and uh, from there, uh, the first three months of the season, um, from August to December, a lot a lot of hype, a lot of a uh, lot of news, a lot of rumblings on newspapers, a lot of scouts coming to watch. Nice. And um, you know, basically, I set out at eighteen, three years before, to to try and do something, and um, and it was really coming, um, it was really coming into fruition. And um, in uh, in January, in the January transfer market, I signed with uh, Brescia Calcio yeah. in, uh, in Serie A. Um, you know, I uh, I went there for a couple of weeks. The plan was not to stay there for the re for um, from January to May. Just go there for a couple of weeks and then go back to Frosinone and finish off the season because we were in first place. Yeah. In Frosinone. So I went back to uh, to Frosinone. I had the chance when I was uh, in those two three weeks that I went to um, to Brescia. Mm -hmm. um, you know those guys like Andrea Pirlo, uh, Roberto Baggio, and you know, Luca Toni, and and uh, so I had the opportunity to train with these guys for two weeks. Um, wow! Had a blast. Actually, the first day I arrived, which was pretty cool, I arrived at the same time and uh, with my agent um, uh, to the uh, training complex at the same moment that Andrea Pirlo. Uh, pulled up with his agent and uh, wow. and uh, it was the first person I met. And then Jesus. when we walked into the dressing room, the first person we both <laughs> met was uh, Roberto Baggio, which was pretty cool. So. Oh my God, you met Roberto Baggio. That's incredible. As an Italian, you must. this is like uh, the cherry. Yeah, I mean, the... look, I, uh, <laughs> it's, it was my dream. I mean, if, uh, if you come to my uh, my parents' house, you'll see posters of uh, Del Piero, Baggio. You'll see, you'll see all that stuff. You'll see... Uh, 
You know, I used to wear my uh, my captain band like Bad Joy. I used to. I, I was and and you got captain. your first contract. You became the first Quebec-born uh, Serie A player to sign a contract. Yeah, yeah. So first Quebec-born soccer player to to sign a contract in Serie A. Wow. Um, and you know, when I came back at Christmas, I already knew I was uh, I was basically signing. And um, and uh, when I came back for Christmas for a couple of weeks, there was a big party at my parents' house. Uh, Wow. Uh, you know, all the family well, yeah, is older, I mean, all the relatives. Yeah, for sure. True, man. for sure. Everybody's dream is to play in Italy, professional yeah. soccer. My brother has a question. He says, Sanjo, what's your favorite Serie A team? Uh, Juventus. Juventus. Okay, that's I'm my a brother. Fan, that's, but... uh, yeah. I'm, I'm actually a AC Milan fan. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, I'm, I'm a Juve fan, but to be honest, um, I like, you know, I like Napoli. I like Roma. I like AC Milan. I like Fiorentina. Yeah. Um, I, there's no teams I really don't like in in Italy or in in world football. Like there's, I just like watching football. I just for me. Do you watch Champions is, League? All the time. Yeah. So yeah, what's what do you like better, Italian soccer, English soccer? Look, I think they all have their own unique uh, way of playing. You know, like I don't like when people say, "Oh, the Premier League is better and the, this is better." Oh, look, in the finals of the Champions League last year, there was two Premier League clubs, so it means it's better. Well, if we go and check the statistics from the last ten years. The Spanish league has more finals appearances in the, in Europa League or Champions League put together. So, so you know, people can can just I guess uh, debate on it all they want, but the reality is that every league is different. Every league is difficult. Uh, yeah. It's not easy. Uh, when I see people saying, uh, "Yeah, Ronaldo went to Italy. He went into a farmers league," uh, like yeah. it, every league is difficult. They have their Absolutely. own style and. Yeah. You know, obviously, right now the Premier League is. You know, there's the hype behind it. There's yeah. the hype, the, the the television contracts, the television quality, the HD, the presentation of the games mm -hmm. is very. Um, I, I I say I say it often. It's very um, NFL style. Yeah, for so sure. It's got a very good presentation to it. You know, which the Italian Serie A or La Liga or even uh, the France uh, the French uh, League or even Bundesliga, they don't have mm -hmm. this great presentation of the game. So. So that's what makes the present uh, the, the Premier League like kind of unique, you know. Nice. Um, so my question, Sandra, this is a big question that I'll I keep hearing, and it's something I wanna I want you to answer properly. Uh, why is in Canada? With it's 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 okay. I get it. It's it's cold here and stuff like that. But a place with thirty seven million people. About uh, listen, just in my city, I live in Saint Leonard actually. Um, Sandra, you played for Saint Leonard. That's yeah, that's right. It's funny. You still live in Saint Leonard? No, I live in Laval. Okay, but yeah. anyways, uh, I'm saying this. So I, I I graduated with such good Italian soccer players and everything. It's like I I just don't I don't understand why Canada is not like a powerhouse or at least some a team that could qualify. You know. Well, look, powerhouse is a big word. I mean, uh, if you look at the, the countries around the world that played football for the longest longest time, uh, take the likes of Serbia, take the likes of uh, I don't know a. Um, uh Czech Republic and stuff like that they they're always in and around the 30 mark 30th in the world you know you have uh, you have some amazing countries that are you know that have a hard time getting into the top 30 and right now Canada's uh, if I'm not mistaken 33rd in the world or 34th in the world yeah and and that's that's already an amazing feat you know so look everybody has their opinion the reality is that soccer is not the same like other sports it's very very difficult um you know, I I, I kind of laugh at times when I hear, yeah, the, the U.S. is coming around and, and they're going to win the World Cup soon, you know, <laughs> like, and I say to myself, well, if you have countries like Belgium, yeah. Holland, uh, that have never won the World Cup and that have been playing this game since it's begun and that have some of the best youth development systems in the exactly. world exactly, and they can't win. How is U.S. going to win, or how is Canada going to win, or how is Mexico going to win? It's really, really tough. And Absolutely. if you go and see who who did win the World Cup, how many countries have won the World Cup? I think it's less than ten countries in the world have won the World Cup. Wow, so, I didn't realize that. It's yeah. crazy. Uh, so you got the chance to play for Team Canada. Uh, so how did that happen? How did you get like picked for Team Canada, and what was your experience with Team Canada? Look, I mean, uh, the experience was fantastic. I mean, putting on your national team jersey is always mm -hmm. something incredible. Uh, hearing the national anthem for the first time, uh, you know, when you're on the field at, at midfield is is unbelievable. Yeah, for 
for sure. Um, it was 2004. I was playing with the, the Montreal Impact. I had a great season. And towards the end of that season, in the, month, uh, in the fall, there were some more qualifying games. It was uh, qualifying for the 2006 World Cup. Yeah. And um, I got a call from uh, Frank Yallop. And uh, the first mm -hmm. game was in Costa Rica. And um, went into the game, uh, went into the training camp where, you know, I didn't think I was going to play or maybe I was going to get a bit of time or whatever. And had a few good days of training. And uh, the day before uh, the game, Frank uh, came up to me, told me, look, tomorrow night you're playing. Wow. So, um, so it was fantastic. It was, uh, it was, you know, it was quite exciting and um, got to play in Costa Rica. We had a, you know, I had a decent game, not the greatest game I've ever had, but I, I played yeah. pretty well. And um, I got a, I got a taste of what it is to, to, to play in World Cup qualifying, you know, and uh, we lost, I think we lost one nil. Oh, that's um, but we did, we did, we, we did well. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, we didn't have the depth that the, the, the national team has today. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So when we uh, remember the coaching staff talking about, like, we he had a list of, like, maybe 35 to 40 players to choose from for the national team back then, you know. And, and nowadays they have they have a list of 60, 70, 80 players, you know, that are playing in, uh, in, uh, in Europe and stuff like that. So, wow. So it, it was fantastic. I mean, like I said, Put Must have been hot there in Costa Rica. Eh? I, I, I was I was listening to one of uh, your podcasts that you're on, and you were telling you were say, talking about the heat in Costa Rica, guys. We're Canadian for those watching that don't know where we're from, but we're from Canada. We're used to the cold and everything. And then all of a sudden, you're playing at lunchtime at the when the sun is hottest. You know what I mean? Yeah. Did your no, head burn? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Look, in Costa Rica, we were lucky. We played in in the evening, but um, yeah. but it was still warm all day. Um, in Honduras was uh, was the game that we played. I think it was noon or one o'clock in the afternoon. It was yeah. scorching hot. It was like forty degrees on the pitch. Um, for sure, they make it uncomfortable for you, right? I mean, when yeah. when the Canadian teams go and play in Mexico, they do the same. They make it uncomfortable for you. Already playing in yeah. Mexico City at Azteca is not easy. I've never had the chance to to play there, but uh, from what I hear is you know the the, the altitude is so. Um, so thick and so it's wow. first of all it's high and it, and breathing is is difficult and uh you can go there three four days before like uh, john limiaris um was was talking on a podcast a, f a few weeks ago with with myself yeah. and uh, he was saying he had a chance to play in, in, in the azteca and he and he said even if you go there three four days before uh it still yeah. becomes difficult you know you're just not used to it you know and you know sanjo a lot of people will not think of these, these things like the heat the altitude the time difference the just like they think, oh, why, why didn't you do good? Why didn't you do? This? There's a lot of other factors in it, you know. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And and what the mistake that we used to make, uh, you know, back in the day was always we would play at, you know, we would play in Vancouver at Swan Guard on grass, which yeah. is, has nice weather. And and uh, we played um, <laughs> we played uh, we played in Montreal. We played in Toronto. Like it, we we always made it comfortable for the opposition. Whereas this time around. Uh, John Herdman and his staff did a great job of of kind of saying, you know what, um, let's play in the snow, let's play when it's cold, yeah. let's play on turf in Edmonton, which is not pleasant. It's not pleasant for either players. It's not going to be more pleasant for the Canadian players than it is for the the uh, the opposition. But the reality is that you know you're you're putting them in a difficult situation, a situation they've never been in. Like the Mexicans were playing in minus ten degrees in Edmonton. Um, <laughs> You know, it was always going to be difficult for them to to adjust. You know, so. Well, listen, today, Sandro. I don't know if you saw outside, but it was hailing like ice, ice pellets. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Would you play in that condition, or would the game be canceled usually? Uh, no, I've played in Italy in in Potenza and Isernia. It's, it, it snowed, and we 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 played. Uh, very rarely were uh, games uh, postponed in Europe. I mean, you play. I mean, in Russia, they play. It's uh, minus ten, minus five. They play. Okay. Um, you know, so it, it, you can play in any weather. The the one that happens more often is actually the uh, the flooding of the field. So when wow. it rains too much, if the ball doesn't bounce or it doesn't roll enough, that's when they'll uh, they'll stop they'll stop a game or they'll uh, they won't okay. play a game. But yeah. uh, usually, um, you know, heat is not an issue and and uh, snow is is not uh, not that big of an issue. Raul has a question. He says, my question for you, Sandro, your opinion on FaceTime soccer. I don't know what that is. 
<laughs> uh, I think he's just playing with you. But uh, no, it's because last week we had Sandro Ferrer on. Okay. And he wasn't able to come on the stream yard, so he face called. He Facebook called. <laughs> right, okay. So I think it's uh, it's like an old to that, you know? Okay, okay. No problem. Oh, I want to know, like, what was the pressure like uh, to qualify? Like, were you being like, was there, was your coach like saying, guys, like, you know, we, we got to make it? Like, was there a lot of pressure? Like, did you feel it? There was a lot of pressure. Did you feel like the coach was kind of like, look, we're here. We're, it's big enough to be here. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, for sure. I mean, the pressure you put on yourself, there's no player that goes into the national team and says, I don't want to play yeah. or I don't care or, you know, you still want to make the World Cup. It's, 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 you might go to the World Cup and not win or whatever, but the reality is that if you're able just to, to say I've been Cup, there, you know? of course, and it's yeah. it's a big, it's what it's it's the biggest event in 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 sports. sports in, in, in the world, I would say you know? probably the biggest event. Yeah, like even, yeah, for sure. It's the I'm biggest. I'm not sure if the event. Super Bowl is bigger, is it? No, it's not no, big. Not even close. Okay. No, wow. no, it's not even close. Um, I mean, uh, the the World Cup uh, finals. Uh, why you you get one billion viewers? Uh, the Super Bowl, you get about a hundred million. Exactly. So you did mention Montreal Impact. Um, yeah. How did you get into the Impact? Was there like a tryout? Like, uh, were you scouted? No, I was already in Italy. I was in Europe, and okay. um, after my uh, stint with uh, with Brescia, I, I, you know, I went back to Frosinone. Then I, I, mm. I was on loan at a couple of clubs, and uh, in 2004, uh, I said to myself, you know what, I'm going to try going back home and, and playing at home. And yeah. I, I was kind of closing the door on on Italy, and I was closing the door on on Europe. Yeah. And um, and uh, I was planning on coming home and just playing with the impact for you know eight, nine, ten years, whatever it is, and okay. uh, just being home. And uh, made a couple of calls. The uh, the impact was uh, was interested. They mm -hmm. uh, they offered me a contract. I came home and um, had a great season, two thousand four. Finally, playing in front of my family and friends. Uh, I, I had missed that uh, that aspect of, uh, of football, you know, playing in front of my uh, my parents and and uh, just performing and you know not worrying about you know the, the stress or whatever like you know the stress that you get playing at the Impact or or in the, or in US or in, or in North America is not the same stress you get in um, in Italy. You know, it's it's uh, so. So did Italy, you feel when you when you came here it was like uh, you know playing for, going from like Triple A to like House League was, was that the feeling you got? Kinda? No. No, not at all. I mean, the, the, the leagues here are not bad. They're, uh, you know, okay. they're obviously, like I said, every league is different. Mm -hmm. You know, it's normal. You'll you'll probably have like some players that are of less quality here or whatever. Yeah. Um, but there's still good soccer players in, in North America like there are around the world. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the reality is, is that, you know, they they have a history in those countries of, of you know, <laughs> they have so many players to choose from, right? So that's, that's the difference. Uh, yeah. Their player pool is is huge, you know. Shout out to D Sassy Diva stepping in. What's up? And Shane McCormick, how you doing? It says hey Angie hey, Shane. It's Sandro, not Shane. <laughs> oh, it's funny. Andrew, what's up? I'm good, D Sassy. Um, my next question for you, I think every Italian gets this question. I, I asked, where were you when Italy won the World Cup in 2006? <laughs> I was on vacation uh, in Wildwood, New Jersey, so there was nobody celebrating with me. But where were you? I was uh, I was in Montreal. I uh, I was playing in Norway at that time, and um, I actually mm -hmm. got married the day before the the World Cup final when Italy played France. Unbelievable. Um, so I came home three days before my uh, my wedding. Um, watched the semifinals here in Montreal against Germany, and then um, and then got married on the weekend. Got married on the Saturday, and on the Sunday uh, watched the, the the finals. And then on the Monday was on a flight back to Norway to go uh, go back to work. You know, so um, it was a fantastic day, fantastic moment. I mean, the parties, the the yeah. just, you know the pride and joy of being Italian and and celebrating yeah. was uh, was pretty cool. Scaldi Scandrus in the building. It says, "What's up, Sandro?" I think I believe he's from Ireland as well. Scaldi Scandrus. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and uh, also Adriano Di Nardo was in the building. He says, Speriamo that both Italy and Canada can get the job done in March, which means the qualifiers. Yeah. Um, and Sandro, I don't know if you know them. They're called the cultural, uh, cultural Guys. Do you know them? Have you ever heard um, of them? I'm not sure. No. On, they're on Instagram, and I believe oh, yeah, you guys, as well. The Culture that. Guys, Sandro, uh, listen, it would, it would be really cool if you could pro possibly do an interview with them. That yeah. would be a, 
I don't, that's why I thought you already knew them, you know, like being in the... I've, I think I've sports. seen their, their page. I think I've come across their page a couple of times, yeah. Yeah, they're great guys. We had them on. We had some great conversations about the World Cup, about the Euro Cup when it was the Euro Cup, and we actually oh, okay. won that. That was uh, yeah. incredible. I, I think I'm going to go back and watch it and see what we said, <laughs> how, what we predicted and everything. So that's yeah. interesting. Um, you did retire, though, in 2011 from professional soccer. Do you regret retiring so early? Um regret uh you know i mean regret's a big word but uh you know i could have played i could have played a few more years um you know but sometimes in 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 life um you get some some um some situations that come up you know uh, kids and and family and stuff like that and um i was close you know i could have gone back to lithuania because i was in lithuania in 2011. yeah uh the club there wanted me to go back and sign a, a two or three year deal um but my um uh, the offer wasn't, you know, great enough for me to to go back and okay. uh, my son my son was going to be born um, that year and so it, it was going to be a, a tough decision to make. Um, I had gone to I had gone to China the year before, so I could have gone back to China. I wasn't too fond of it, but the, the you know there were some things that came up. But in in the end, um, I was gonna pursue if if the financially it was going to be. Uh, something uh substantial okay um but at that point it was like okay you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna call it quits and then just you know see what i do next there was more uh important priorities i would say there was life changed you you were at a certain point in like stage in your life where it's like you had to make decisions and your family always comes first right sanjo yeah for sure for yeah. sure so. uh d sassy diva is from jamaica she said can you come and train the jamaicans how to play soccer <laughs> although we have some valuable players i think they need more guidance and training yeah jamaica has, does have some good players i mean they've always had good players it's uh i think uh the, the struggle with jamaica and trinidad is is um is you know the consistency and and uh the development programs are are still exactly. not uh, not fully developed so there's there's a lot of work to be done in those countries, but every now and then they they come up with some really really good players, you know, and, and for sure. So, yeah, and uh, that leads me to my next question. Actually, what does it take to be a pro soccer player? What qualities does it take? Your physique, everything. Um, look, I think the first and foremost, it's uh, what's in between your two ears, which is your mind. Uh, mentally, you need to be um, you need to be really really good, really strong, uh, because it's not always up. There's ups and downs, and uh, yeah. if you're not able to pick yourself up when you're down, uh, or stay on your feet when you're up, um, uh, instead of like you know thinking you're too good or or becoming uh, becoming uh, more more relaxed, you know, in those moments there, it, it, it's it's very um, it's very important to, to stay uh, <laughs> humble, to stay humble, and and just work at it and keep on going, you know. Um, you know, I see uh, Messi, Ronaldo, and I say to myself, you know, like uh, the thing that that brings that that makes them different than everybody else is is their minds. They're they're both Absolutely. they're both really really strong in the mind. Uh, they lead healthy life lifestyles. You know, that's huge. Mm -hmm. uh, they go to bed early. They get they they eat the right things. They're these are all things that work. Yeah. yeah, they're they're very very disciplined. This these are all the things that make it make uh, the difference. You know, then obviously you know like uh, you know there's talents and and. Most talents have the same skill set, uh, some a little bit more, some a little bit less. Uh, there's not one aspect of the game that's that's going to dictate if you're going to become a pro soccer player. So yeah. you can be fast, doesn't really matter because you can be slow like Xavi and and think fast. Yeah. Or or be slow like Busquets and never lose the ball. You know. So there's there's different types of player. Uh, I like I said, I played alongside Andrea Pirlo, or Roberto yeah. Baggio. These guys were not physically dominant. Yeah. They were not, uh, you know, super athletes. Or but they were whatever. workhorses. They were good. They were honest, uh, humble workers on the field every day. And um, they thought the game, you know, soccer is a very, um, is a game that, that's, that's a lot is played in the mind. Absolutely. How fast can you think? Because there's a lot of things going on on the pitch at the same time. You know, there's, there's, you got 10 teammates on the field. And uh, you're playing against 11 opposition. The, the picture's changing at all times. For sure. Uh, so you're always trying to find solutions. And it's not so easy. It's not so easy. So there's not one solution, you know. I mean, I played yeah. with, uh, with, Pe with Guardiola in, uh, mm -hmm. in, in Brescia as well. 
And um, he wasn't physically strong, wasn't fast, but his brain would just think at so such a fast pace that it was really, yeah. really hard to for you to anticipate what he was going to do next or, or, you know, try to try to um, block his next pass or, or his next decision, you know, so. Yeah. Sean P said, James Milner, the biggest workhorse in football history. <laughs> yeah, look, I, uh, he's him and, uh, and Henderson are, uh, are definitely workhorses. I mean, have that skill set. You know, if you ask both of them, would they uh, would they like to use their skill set to play like Andrea Pirlo or, or Busquets? And they'll tell you, no, we don't have that skill set. You know, so they they're two very good players that play to their own strengths, and and that's also a big key: being able to recognize what's 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 your strengths. Being um, you you're you're attached to almost every player on the pitch, yeah. so you're kind of linked up and you're. Your, your game intelligence needs to be very, very high. And if you look at it carefully, you know, who's the best coach in the world right now? Probably Pep Guardiola. He was a midfielder. <laughs> um, Ancelotti was a midfielder. Um, you know, the, there's a lot, a lot of coaches that were midfielders or center backs. And uh, Steven Gerrard right now, like, there's there's so many good coaches right now. And a lot of them are midfielders or defenders, you know. And, and that just goes to show how those positions think the game, you know. Yeah. Incredible. Uh, so then you, you, one of your, is it, I don't know if it's your first coaching uh, gig, but you were technical director of Les Etoiles de l'Est. So uh, t tell me a bit about that experience. Yeah. I mean, uh, in 2011, when I started coaching, uh, there was a job opportunity with Etoiles de l'Est and I, uh, I accepted as technical director. Um, you know, it was a club that hadn't done much in, in the past. And uh, so they gave me basically the mandate to, revamp the club, uh, start a brand new program, you know, get things rolling, develop as many players as possible. Uh, was there for 10 years, spent some great years there, had a very good time with uh, developing a lot of those, a lot of those players with the help of my staff. And uh, look, now, now 10 years later, 12 years later, I, um, you know, I see uh, over 20, 20 players that uh, that came through our uh, development system that are playing at the next level, whether they're playing in NCAA or whether they're playing pro or whether they played a little bit of pro and, uh, you know, didn't have the, uh, the luck to, uh, to, to be, um, to be that successful, yeah. but that's, you know, that's for us, that's uh, something that uh, makes us very proud because when you're in a youth club, your goal, your objective is really to produce as many players as possible. And, to be able to do it in a small club like a 12 of in the East of Laval uh, yeah. was kind of special. Nice. Uh, you know, growing up and playing soccer uh, at a young age, it, it was much different than now, Sanjo, with all like social media and the phones and COVID especially. How was it different uh, like as a, a youth soccer player now versus in your days? Look, I think now, uh, you know, a lot of the soccer that's played is structured, you know, so you have practice, you go to practice, you train, you have a game, you go to a game, you train. Uh, back in the day, it was it was that plus you go to the park and play with your buddies. You go to the park and play with your friends. Uh, so you were you were playing very very often, often, and um, not always in a structured environment. You know, I mean, a lot of coaches wanna wanna run sessions. They wanna they wanna try and teach the players everything. But the reality is that the coaches don't have all the answers. You know, and, and guided guided discovery is 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 key. Uh, discovery on their own through their own abilities is also key. Um, you know, I think uh, Johan Cruyff posted one time on um, on the internet. Um, there was a post on Johan Cruyff, him saying, um, "I train three days a week um, uh, with Ajax, and I and I played uh, and I played another. Uh, no, he said something like, "I was on the field with Ajax for like five hours a week training." Yeah. And I spent another 15 hours a week playing with my friends on the, on, in the streets. Where do you think I developed? You know, so wow. it, it's, there's, a, there's a big, um, you know, it's very, very important for the kids to play on their own, to, uh, to mm -hmm. be able to, uh, to get outdoors and just explore, just not have the, you know, the parents around, not have the, the coaches around and just be able to make mistakes and find solutions on their own. Yeah, uh, the chat was uh, trolling us there because <laughs> basically we had some technical difficulties last week with Sandro Fair, so they're just okay. making jokes like we can't hear Sandro. <laughs> and the, a lot of these guys are in the same probably Discord group and they're just trying to play at me. Oh, it's hilarious. Okay. Um, but Adriano Dinardo from the Calcio guys, he's saying, yeah. Who's your cultural idol growing up? 
Yeah, like I said before, uh, Roberto Baggio, the, the Diego Maradona were, were the guys that I uh, that I looked at, uh, that I watched a lot uh, in the nineties. Uh, Del Piero started to come into the picture. That was yeah. that was also a guy that uh, you know Zidane, and uh, and then you know Ronaldo, the Ronaldo the Brazilian, mm -hmm. um, and then and then Messi and Ronaldo after that, you know. So yeah. Uh, out of all the countries you played in, Sandro, which one did you find the most interesting out of all the foreign countries? Um, obviously, Italy. I mean, because of the culture, because of our heritage, you know, and, and the fact that I was, uh, you know, I was very, very close to, 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 um, to being able to, uh, to play in, in Serie A for, for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. But, um, I mean, for sure, that's the country that I'd... Uh, <laughs> If I go back, I'd go back to Italy again, 100%. Absolutely, uh, number one. Uh, I want to know something, uh, Sandro. I don't know if you do get a lot of hate, if you get criticism, whether uh, as a player or a coach. Uh, and look, I don't think there's one person in the world that doesn't get hate. So how do you deal with that? Like, especially like incidents that happen, people that like, you know, just try to like push your buttons and stuff like that. How do you deal with that hate and criticism? Look, I mean, you just got to live with it. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. most of the people that that uh, talk talk that way or, or post stuff on on social media, it's you know they do it from from the the comfort of their home. You know, they they wouldn't tell you that to your <laughs> to your face. You know, and uh, in person, you know, so you just got to let it go. You got to rub it off and just let it go. I mean. It happens all the time. If you're if you constantly start thinking about everything that everybody says, it, it becomes uh, becomes uh, heavy, yeah. and uh, you lose focus on what your what your goal is, what your purpose is. You know, like yeah. And you know, these big time athletes like Messi, Ronaldo, and Jordan, and LeBron James, and uh, and Federer, and, uh, and Djokovic, and mm -hmm. Nadal, they, they get destroyed every day on social, social media, media, just like they get praised every day on social media. You know, so. Yeah, I, I don't think it's good to look at the praise uh, and and not look at the negative. I think it's it's not good to look at either. Um, just, I mean, the fans are there. Just appreciate them. They pay uh, they pay the ticket to go to stadium and and you know that's what. Basically and if you're doing. pissing off somebody, you must be doing something good, right? Because then there yeah. it creates a, an opportunity for someone to be jealous. Uh, yeah. You know, to, who, to who are like, the oh, most? I don't have that, you know. Yeah, who are the most criticized uh, soccer players in the world? It's always Ronaldo and Messi, and yet they're the, and yet they're the two of the greatest uh, players. But I want to make a comment on that, Sandro. Like yeah. you know, you said Messi is one of the greatest. In my opinion, though, okay, to be one of the greatest, you have to have won a World Cup. No. In my no. opinion, listen, that's like one of those unpopular opinions there, but yeah. like it's it's like in hockey. Like if so, if you tell me this guy's the best hockey player, but he never won a Stanley Cup. I, I don't know. Like he, you know to, who to be often the says best, that? you have to have won, right? Yeah, but you know who often says that? Uh, people that watch North American sports. Mm -hmm. Soccer is different. So yeah. he just won the Copa America. Ronaldo won the Euro. Yeah. They're no less. Those two tournaments are no less than the World Cup. Uh, sure. They've won Champions Leagues. How many? Multiple Champions Leagues each. Those are no less than the World Cup. You know? Uh, I have friends that tell me, yeah, but look, uh, you Look at the football. You got to win the Super Bowl. Yeah, but it's one tournament. It's the only tournament that exists. Yeah. Uh, you got to win the Stanley Cup. It's the only tournament in hockey that's important. You know. Um, so, in, in soccer, it's a little bit of a different beast. It's, uh, it's I know. I think it's important that, uh, you know, they, it's not like they haven't won anything, and um, so so somebody's gonna tell me Maradona is better than Messi and Ronaldo because Maradona won a World Cup. But Maradona and his stats don't even come close to those two guys. Exactly. So it's you know, like, so so you got to take a bit of both. You know, now if you tell and me the Pelé, times are different too, right? Exactly. Yeah. And if oh. you tell me Pele, well, Pele won three World Cups, but exactly uh, two or three, but um, he never played in Europe. Really? So, yeah, he never played in Europe. <laughs> We have Brazil, the harmful penguins in the building, uh, all the way from, I believe, Uzbekistan. Oh, yeah? Hope nice. you're safe there, buddy, guys. All, with all that's going on in Ukraine, and literally today there were sanctions on them. But we're not going to talk about that. That's just, no, no. just you know, what's going on with the news. But it's funny. I hope you're safe, uh, harmful penguin. 
Uh, Adriano DiNardo said, it's different in North American sports and Calcio Ange. You know what? I, I, I think Sanjo would probably agree with that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a bit different. It, it, it's Look, it's very different. Like, you know, the, the NFL has a salary cap, more or less – more or less everybody gets to share the trophy yeah. um you know you have great players like you and Cruyff that never won a, a world cup absolutely um you have you have multiple greats in in the in the in football that haven't won a world cup you know so it's just it, it it's not easy it's not easy it's uh it's very very difficult and mm-hmm. you know and look maradona won one world cup and and the next world cup he lost in in the finals, the in '82 he lost. Uh, I don't even think they passed the second round. Um, so it's a, it's a different type of uh, different type of sport. Uh, different. Um, it's a different beast. A different beast. Yeah. I think. If you could be a coach of any soccer club, which one would it be? Um, I'd have to say Juventus, just because it's my my team. <laughs> uh, so uh yeah for sure juventus i mean uh it would be uh it would be quite special uh, being able to coach here and the, the team that you uh you cheered for growing up you know, so yeah out of all your memories uh in your career what was the most memorable uh defining moment well look i mean obviously um in when i first signed my contract with uh with brescia that was that was definitely uh up there uh playing my first game on a national team in costa rica was definitely up there uh, and then let's not hide. Uh, let's not hide behind the fact that the, the goal against Spain that I scored is uh, definitely something that uh, no one can ever take away from me, and um, and I'll uh, I'll forever be grateful for that moment for sure. For sure, that has to be a memorable moment for sure. Uh, before we get into our discussion about the World Cup, though, what advice can you give to uh, somebody that wants to be a professional soccer player, a little kid, uh, ten years old, eleven years old, that's thinking about playing pro? Look, it's, uh, it's not easy and it's not impossible. So don't let anybody tell you that it's impossible. You need to be realistic because it's not, it's yeah. not like people think, you know, like a lot of kids here think, oh, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna go to Europe and I'm going to play in first division, second division. Well, you might have to be ready to start in fifth division and sixth division because it's not that easy, you know. And uh, a lot of people leave here with the misconception that they're talented, they do well in the leagues here. And they think it's going to be the same thing when they get to Italy, and it's not. You know, it's it's totally different. Um, wow. So you know, definitely hard work, like like any anything else. You have to work mm-hmm. really hard at it. Uh, you got to be lucky. You yeah. Be lucky as well. You make your own luck, but you got to be a little bit lucky. For sure. And um, and I think I think you you just need to, if you're strong in your mind, you can do a lot of things. You can do a lot of things. If you're, if you're weak in your mind, as soon as there's going to be a couple of hiccups in the road, it's going to be difficult and, and it's, going to be, it's going to get more and more difficult as you go along. You know? So uh, there's going to be many challenges, many people that don't want to, you know, I went to Italy and, you know, some of the players in the team were, were really not, uh, not nice to me or, or, or stuff like that. But you have to gain your respect. You know, no, nobody's going to give you respect, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, now that now you're actually technical director for FC Laval, uh, I want to know how you got that job. How you were introduced to that job? Who chose you? And what, what what is your role as technical director of FC Laval? Yeah, so I got that job in in October. Uh, they called me up, did an interview. Uh, this FC Laval is a brand new club. It's only a year that it exists. It's uh, three clubs put uh, put into uh, into one. Um, so it's a big challenge. It's, a, it's a quite, quite, quite a big club. In, in the summer, will be uh, about three thousand players, if not more. And um, you know, what's the, what's the role? The role is to you know basically build build a program, build a philosophy, a training philosophy, a playing philosophy, a training methodology. Uh, help the coaches understand what needs to be taught to the players in in training sessions. And um, and uh, produce as many players as possible, you know, and, and just be there to, to help the players, help the boys, help the girls. And, um, you know, build yourself a staff around you because you're not going to be able to do that type of job on your own. And, um, and that's it. Just direct everybody and make, make sure everybody's held accountable for the, uh, for the work that they do on the pitch with the, with the players. That's funny. Uh, the, har- the harmful penguin says, "I don't understand Canada dialect. Please write English or USA." 
<laughs> it's funny because Canada is English, but anyway, you're too funny. Uh, hateful Pegler, you're the best. Mr. McMahon said uh, Kuluzevsky is better than Ronaldo. Yeah, is Kuluzevsky uh, a soccer player? I don't know. Yeah, Kuluzevsky is uh, <laughs> he used to he used to be with Juve, and now he's with uh, Tottenham. He's a uh, young Swedish uh, Swedish player. He's a good player, but he's not close to Ronaldo. <laughs> really? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would ask you, Sanjo, if you have any upcoming projects now. I don't know. Like, obviously, we can't tell the future, but is there something you want to, like, a bucket list thing you want to do for as a coach, maybe? Oh, for sure. I mean, uh, look, build this club um, to 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 become one of the top clubs in in the province, if not the the country. Uh, it's got great potential. We have we have a lot of good supporting staff, so that's definitely something that's on my list. Um, and then. Obviously, my dream is to coach pro, so that's definitely something that I'm I'm uh, I'm always looking at, and um, you know, hopefully, uh, the stars align and and I'm able to find a, a pro coaching job, uh, whether it's in Canada or North America or Europe or anywhere else, Asia, Africa, wherever it is, and uh, take uh, see what I can do at the next level, just just like I did with uh, as a player. So you you want to go like full on and be a pro coach? That's your dream. I hope it happens for you, Sandra. I'm counting on you. We're going to pay close attention to that. There is a question. Before we get into our World Cup discussion over here, yeah. there was a question by Adriano. He said, sorry, Sandro, just to go on before. I don't know if this was discussed, but did you ever have the chance to play for Italy? Uh, no, I never had the chance to play for Italy. I mean, I could have chose both. I could have chose either or because I had two passports. But the reality is that to play, to play for Italy, you need to be... Uh, you need to be world class, and I wasn't. I wasn't a world class player. I was a decent player. Uh, I was good for for Canada, but you know, playing for one of those big countries like that, you need to be. Uh, you need to be a, a, a notch above. That's hilarious. Ross said, "Will there be a live soccer performance?" Because the thing is, I usually have musicians on, okay. and we do an interview on performance. So he's making a joke. That's hilarious. Uh, okay, guys, on to our uh, World Cup. Uh, discussion guys 2022 it's coming Sandro it's coming yeah. in November uh, what are your thoughts about this World Cup the place the teams the qualifying look the place I mean uh, from you know I don't have much much knowledge of Qatar I've never been uh, I see the stadiums that they built they look unbelievable um, so I think it's going to be quite the, the interesting tournament you know I mean they built stadiums with air conditioning in it because because it's so it's so hot in Qatar, yeah. <laughs> so um, I think it's going to be a cool experience, something uh, something different. Um, you know, uh, hopefully Italy can uh, can uh, qualify for this uh, for this World Cup because uh, two World Cups in a row without Italy being there would be uh, sad to Disaster, say the least. For sure. Yeah, to say <laughs> the least. So hopefully, um, hopefully uh, all goes well with Italy. Canada makes it through. And um, look, it's going to be an interesting one. Playing in November, December is different, so yeah, for sure that's going to be uh, something uh, something cool. Uh, but for us, you know, in November, December, you know, are the parades going to happen? Are the all, all these things going to happen? That's the thing, eh? Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. So it's interesting, guys. We have Canada. If you guys aren't following the qualifiers, Canada's like this close to making it. They're most likely going to make it. Yeah. It's the first time since when, Sandro? When's the last time Canada made it? 1986. 1986, guys. That's what, 2014? 30 something years? 30, 36 years ago. 36 years ago, guys. Uh, I can't believe this is happening. It's going to be really interesting. Who's the best player in Canada? I think it's Alfonso Davies. Yeah, Alfonso yeah. Davies is uh, definitely top uh, world-class player. And then you have uh, Jonathan David, who's, uh, who's also uh, very, very good. You have Atiba Hutchison, who's uh, a little bit older now. And, yeah. Uh, Great, great player, great guy. Um, I, had, I had the opportunity to play with him. Um, very nice guy. Very and hats off to him because he's 37, 38 right now, and he's still playing, and it's it's uh, it's amazing, you know. And it's either Italy or Portugal. Hey, eh? that's that's something that's really heartbreaking eh, for a lot of soccer fans. Yeah, well, in the group they have uh, Italy, Macedonia, Portugal, and uh, Turkey. So we'll see what happens. It's Portugal against Turkey first, then Italy against Macedonia. Um, Look, I mean, to get to the World Cup, you got to beat the best. We made a couple of mistakes in the, the qualifying round. A uh, couple of missed penalties by Jorginho, that, uh, or else we would have been already in. So hopefully they can uh, they can get it done. 
I know. Uh, do you know the actual roster of uh, the like most likely what the roster is going to be like for Italy? Well, no, they tried. Uh, they had a camp uh, not too long ago, and they tried some new players. Tried some. Uh, tried some older players. They brought in Balotelli again. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, they brought in Mario Balotelli again. So, um, I know Chiesa's out because he's got a knee oh. injury, so he's going to be out for uh, next six, seven months. Okay. Um, just hopefully everybody's healthy, and uh, and then we'll go from there. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, I'm really excited for the World Cup. We're hoping Italy can make it. I know that England is probably going to be still pretty strong. Uh, yeah, I mean, England is always uh, always England. Uh, you know, they they come into tournaments always, uh, you know, one of the talking nations. Uh, I think they uh, they haven't lived up to what they uh, they could be, you know. Uh, in the Euro, they were, they were very good. And uh, in the end, met Italy that was just a little bit better than them. Yeah, um, but they're always they're always competitive, you know. So that's that's great for them. Who do you think is the one player to watch at the World Cup 2022, like the the tournament player, in your opinion? Um, I'm gonna say Mbappe. Yeah, you 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 just read it out of my mind, man. Uh, me too. But to me, to me, it's Kylian Mbappe's tournament. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. There's a few uh, other players like uh, that I was reading about there. Some young players, rookies, you know. So I'm interested. Yeah, there's some too. some. Um, there's a couple of good Spanish young players, Pedri and um, and Gavi, that are uh, that are unbelievable. So uh, you know they can be the new uh, the new Iniesta and Xavi uh, for, for for Spain. So that could be pretty cool. There was Pedri. Is that what you just mentioned? Pedri and uh, Gavi. Yeah, great. And Xavi as well. Okay. No, Gavi. 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 Yeah. What about Brazil? I'm hearing about this Jesus or something. Well, there's Gabriel Jesus. That's decent, but uh, no, they, I mean Brazil is always going to be solid. You know. I mean, uh, yeah. Sassi said Neymar. Germany, Portugal, Spain, Argentina. Absolutely, those are like the the powerhouses here. Uh, well, it Sassi, all depends. Portugal is not uh, not part of that, and it's Italy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly. Yeah, uh, but it is the the okay. I don't think Jamaica is, belongs to Portugal. It's not. It's. It's. There is a country in the Caribbean that is owned by Portugal, by the Commonwealth no, of Portugal. In, I think it's in, uh, in in Africa, and it's. Um, oh, I don't remember the name of the, the country. Uh, yeah, there's there's a couple of nations in in um, in Africa that are uh, that are yeah. Portuguese as well. Interesting. Yeah, there's mm. Portuguese a bit everywhere. Yeah. Listen, Sandro, uh, you've been amazing today. A round of applause to you. Answering <laughs> all the questions, uh, of course. Uh, and listen, if you have any suggestions for guests on the show, I would love to hear them, Sandro. You, you could even mention to me after our broadcast tonight. Uh, guys, go check out Sandro Grande on Instagram, guys. It is in the description. Uh, let me just see the comment here. I said maybe Brazil. Exactly. Guys, thank you very much for watching. It was awesome having Sandro. In my opinion, guys, he's a pioneer soccer player in Montreal and, and now an amazing coach. We're rooting for you, Sandro, to make it to the big leagues in coaching. <laughs> I, I'm convinced that will happen. We, we see it in hockey all the time. Like people that play, uh, they play for the Team Canada, the World Juniors, the coaches, and they become big coaches in the NHL. You know, so yeah, for we're sure. Definitely uh, rooting for you, buddy. Thank you, thank you very much for having me, and uh, it's always no a problem. pleasure. Melanie Scarfo is in the building as well. Sorry, I, I saw your comment, but I forgot to. Uh, Hi, Melanie. Give you a shout well, out. I, we actually went to school together, so that's. I got out of here. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, she said, it's great night, Sandra. You're awesome. So humble. Uh, yeah, exactly. This was one of the most smoothest uh, podcasts I've had this season for sure. Uh, definitely. The, uh, these said, Jamaica not going anywhere for now. Ho I don't know if they, they're able to make it, it, it with Canada. No, who's no. there's only um, right now in the mix. It's uh, basically Canada, US, Mexico, Panama, and uh, maybe an outside shot for Costa Rica. But mm -hmm. um, it's not going to be easy for them. They're, they're quite... Yeah. Well, listen, God bless Jamaica, guys, and uh, there, there's always next World Cup. Well, Italy was out last World Cup, you know what I mean? And that was heartbreaking for us. So uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Listen, good night, everybody. Good night, Sandro. Thanks again for coming, guys. Thank you. Me and Sandro are signing out, guys. Good night. Ciao. 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 ciao.